United States is one big reservation, and we are all in it. So says Russell Means, the legendary Oglala Sioux actor, writer, and activist. He captured national attention when he led the 71-day armed takeover of the sacred grounds of Wounded Knee. Our crew traveled to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation to talk about the collapsing economy, U.S.-sponsored genocide, and why the American Indian has the lowest life expectancy in the Western Hemisphere. Hello, my relatives. What I have to say about myself is that uh, I've been to prison. I've been a thief. I've been a uh, doper, a dope dealer. And I've also gone to college. I'm an accountant and a computer programmer as well as getting my doctorate in philosophy. I've been everywhere in the strata of white society. I've even hung around with multimillionaires when there were no billionaires. I am an Indian, American Indian. I prefer American Indian to anyone born in the Western Hemisphere is a Native American. I'm an Oglala Lakota from the Pine Ridge Sioux Indian Reservation, which is still designated in the Defense Department as uh, prisoner of war camp number 44. You see, Indian people, we don't have any rights, any constitutional protections on the reservation whatsoever. No freedom of speech, no privacy. Wow, you Americans are in the same boat. As far as being an American Indian and a Lakota, I also belong to the Republic of Lakota because a significant portion of my people went, withdrew from the treaties we made with the federal government, the 1851 and the 1868 Sioux treaties uh, and American treaties signed at Fort Laramie, which is now Wyoming but that's in the Republic of Lakota. So when we withdrew from the treaties because of gross violations, according to the laws that the United States of America is signatory to, and we have a strategy for attaining our complete independence and a return for our land. I've written an autobiography, Russell Means, Where White Men Fear to Tread is the title. It's a very thick book, 550 pages, but I'm very proud. I've had 17 printings in 16 years. So people are interested in who we are. And it's actually a comprehensive history based on my family of our existence in the 20th century and the deprivations we went through and the trials and tribulations. And so if you really want to find out about us, read my book, and then you can go to research any place you want to. But you see, the sad thing in America is that we don't exist in the 20th century. You have to specialize in Indian education of some sort, anthropology, history, and then f go and dig in the archives of wherever in order to find out anything about us in the 20th century. So there you have it. You know, the American people for too long have been an irresponsible free people. And even generation to generation as they've become less free, they don't recognize it. They have lost the ability of critical thought. In order to regain c critical thought, all you have to do is read your constitution and then look at the laws that govern you especially from the federal perspective. It's unconscionable to allow your freedoms to be taken away 
decade after decade after decade, year after year. And I'm very proud of this, by the way. My nation, the Lakota, were the first nation to militarily defeat the United States of America on the field of battle. And that resulted in the 1868 Sioux Treaty. Be that as it may, what has happened after they economically forced us into these prisoner war camps by destroying our food supply and our, our, our right of passage in our own land, they confined us to these and then they began practicing and perfecting their colonial tactics. What has happened is now America, because of the irresponsibility of your forebearers and the irresponsibility of yourselves, you are now on one huge Indian reservation. All policies, all policies were bred and born and birthed on, the, on an Indian reservation and then exported to the world and now comes, comes back on the backs of the American people. You have a near-perfect document. In the words of uh, Benjamin Franklin in 1744 to a collection of colonists discussing freedom, he said to them, and I quote, If a nation to the north can form a near-perfect union that has endured for centuries, why cannot we form a more perfect union Unquote. So they're talking about the Iroquois Confederacy and that's where the Constitution comes from because in 1988 on the eve of the 200-year anniversary of uh, the Constitution, it was a unanimous thank you by the Congress of the United States. They sent in writing to the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy thanking them for their input into the Constitution and the formation of the United States of America. So you see, the Constitution is Indian law, and that's why I love it. You know, beginning in the 1840s, they start stripping away your freedoms by developing the corporation. You know, a piece of paper. A piece of paper. And then in the 1870s, of course, during Lincoln, when he declared martial law, and even after they, they ceased civil war, martial law continued on for another three or four years when it was no need to. And you go on and on, but in the 1870s, that's when Congress started giving the banks the right to rule. And of course, you go on to 1913 and the beginning of the 20th century, that's when they, they officially gave away the power of our economy to the banks. You know? They can print the money for us. According to our Constitution, you should never allow, the people should never allow their money to be printed by someone else. Hello? So the, the history of the Indian and the history of the American have now come full circle and were intertwined in the dictatorial policies of those that control the monetary system of America. And they've, they have done such a bad job of it that they're destroying themselves. <laughs> it's ludicrous at best. What has happened <clears throat> in Indian policy, or I should say American policy now, is that because you don't have control of your money, the international community has refused to invest any more into the financial instruments of America because they know they're worthless, that the United States is too far in debt and cannot cover it. So consequently, they've refused to buy the bonds and the treasury notes, etc. At any rate, the Federal Reserve has been, oh, for over a year, way over a year, been printing money 
when no one's buying the, the uh, financial instruments of the United States. So what the Federal Reserve has been doing is buying those federal bonds and treasury notes and then printing more money. <laughs> it's absolute suicide. And it's been proven from empire to empire that when you allow your human right, your individual rights to be usurped, that's when empire grows and, and could care less. I, I, I was growing up when this country, they started emptying this country. Around the 50s, the unions had become so powerful they were about to form their own political party. They had shown during World War II how powerful they were in the vote for the presidency and the Congress. But they sat down with the bankers <clears throat> and the government around 1950, give or take a year, and they made a deal. The leaders of the unions made a deal with the leaders of America and so sold out the unions. So when the people began to organize and gather and really have some power, it was negated. And it's been negated ever since. Ever since. You know, you have no privacy. None. You have no protections anymore. Now, I could, I could be a smart aleck and say, how does it feel? Because I know how it feels living on a reservation prisoner of war camp. Now, I can be an American, take my social security card, and leave the reservation, and be like the rest of you. you know, they, they welcomed that. Because in America, they had forced relocation for Indian people back in the 50s. It was fostered under Truman, the relocation plan. And the man appointed to run that, the first man, he was the one who headed up the Japanese internment relocation program during World War II. So he went and headed up the relocation office for the American Indians, and we were, I know, I went on relocation twice. That's kind of a con job, but I, know, I made it out twice. And that's what they want to do, a diaspora, and therefore, guess whose land they're after? In our meager holdings on trust land, over 40% of the natural resource wealth of America is still under and on our lands. 40%. It's curious to me that wherever they put us was full of energy from our grandmother of the earth. That's a thought you should think about. So consequently, you know, if we had the right or the rights that you had, you had, we would be richer than the Saudis if we had the right to join in a capitalist society. And we damn sure wouldn't have allowed Wall Street to use our money for derivatives, etc., etc., you know, and enough isn't enough, and they start creating financial mythology, and you allow it. That's the crime. You have no one to blame but yourself. Look in the mirror. If you can't move and protect yourselves, then guess what happens? Look around you. Look at Detroit. Etc. Etc. It's unconscionable what's happening to America. Now, <clears throat> because of the Federal Reserve and the fact that our money is now worthless, this economy in the United States is going to continue to deflate because you have nothing to back it up. You've exported everything that makes a country run. You've allowed that to happen for greed, for your Walmarts. You know? 